Does anyone in here like romantic movies? We all like romantic movies, especially the women. I think women are hardwired for romance. I've studied romantic movies for a while. The proverbial chick flick, you know, the rom-com. In those movies, I'm talking about chick flicks, guys act like girls. Did you know that? <laughs> they always have a full head of hair. They have that stealth wealth. They're sensitive, compassionate. They're great cooks. They like taking long walks on the beach, and they prefer cuddling <laughs> over anything. There's the pursuit. Then there's always some sort of a drama, trauma type situation. Then right before the credits roll, the choice. Will she say yes or no? Will he say yes? or no. And then we sort of feel that vibe, and they lived happily ever after. That's the chick flick. On the other hand, you have movies for guys. In the movies for guys, women act like men. They're always beautiful. They're aggressive, they're tough, they like sports, and they're pursuing the guy. Then you have some bullets and bombs and fights. At the end of the movie, before the credits roll, and they live happily ever after. It's interesting, isn't it? As I said, we're made for romance. We love falling in love. Romance. I love these movies, though. Whether you're watching Netflix or maybe reading a book, it's romance, romance, romance. And I've been researching writers and producers of these things, of movies in general, and they know, they figured out that when it comes to choosing a movie, if a guy and the girl are gonna choose to watch something, the girl always wins. Whatever she chooses is the movie that they end up watching. Have you noticed that, guys? Have you noticed that, guys? Yeah. So now there's romance in almost anything and everything. It's everywhere. The ubiquitous romance. It just kind of flows. This book is a book about romance. This book is the ultimate romance novel, the Bible. Did you, did you know that? Because the Bible is about love. God loves you and me. He has romanced you and me. Now, there's some warts in there, sin. Yet, even though we're sinners, God romanced us to such a degree that he made the ultimate sacrifice by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, thereby giving us an opportunity before the credits roll to respond Yes or no? You remember when, when you were younger, you'd write that note to that special someone? I love you, do you love me? Circle yes or no. It was that simple. But I would, I would get all nervous and freaked out. What's she gonna say? What's she gonna say? What's she gonna say? And then, oh, she said yes. The God of the universe has sent you and me a love note. I love you, do you love me? Yes or no? Circle your answer. Have you circled the answer? Great questions. We've been reading through the Old Testament, you know, as a church, we have been reading through the Bible in real time. If you've not joined us on this journey, Pick up a chronological Bible, it's that easy, and start today. Because in a couple of weeks, not next week, but the next week, I'll kick off the New Testament. 
So you can start today reading, okay? Now, one of the things I've discovered in reading through the Bible so far is how much God loves us and how much God pursues us. And even though God is sovereign, we have a free will. We can either choose yes or no. We circle yes or no. I've, I've discovered that. I've also discovered that when we go our own way, thinking we're going to gain independence away from God, we end up being dependent on what we chase. We end up being slaves to greed, to materialism, to money, to sex, to alcohol, to drugs, to you name the vice. When we go our own way, away from God, we end up crashing right into God. Well, today's story is gonna be unique. I'm gonna tell you this is going to be like, what? Are you kidding me? Because this story illustrates God's love toward you and me. It illustrates God's romance about you and me. It's a, a real time, real story about real romance. God tells a preacher, his name was Hosea, a pastor who was a prophet back in the day to Israel. God says, hey Hosea, I want you to marry that high class call girl. Yeah, God said that. I want you to marry that prostitute, that hooker, that woman of the night. Some were like, are you, that's in the Bible. <laughs> yes, it is. Because God is gonna show us his love for Israel because Hosea stands for God. His wife, who I'll describe in a second, the call girl, represents Israel. Hosea stands for the Lord and his wife stands for you and me because we're, we're sinners. We've all committed adultery. Do you know what Hosea's wife's name was? I mean, she was hot. She was the most beautiful girl on the planet. She was the it girl, the A-lister. Hosea's wife, this high-class call girl, was named Gomer. Shazam! <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Everyone here over 45 just got what I said. You did. Our church is so young, I wanna throw, I wanna throw you a bone now and then for humor. I mean, I'm not 45 yet, but. I love Gomer Pyle, USMC, Google it. Sergeant Carter, move it, move it, move it. Here's some trivia. Who was Gomer Pyle's girlfriend? Luann Poovey, that nightclub singer. I'll never forget the first time they introduced Luann Poovey in Gomer Pyle. She was singing in the nightclub. That old black magic running down my spine. I love that. And, and, and Gomer just swept her off of her feet and it was a true romance. But I don't know, my brother and I, when we watched that as little kids, we're like, mm, I don't know if Luann Poovey really fits, but they were about to jump the shark. You know, it had been going for so many years, they had to throw in something. And I think the writers and producers were finally getting smart going, we gotta throw romance even in Gomer Pyle. So Gomer was her name. And what she did was a shame. She was a major league escort, tooling around the Middle East in her Bentley, flying from Milan to Miami. All of the sugar daddies just, just giving her all of these gifts and God tells Hosea, Hosea, marry this hooker. And he did. So she became a pastor's wife. That'd be a good title, from a prostitute to a pastor's wife, somebody help me. Isn't that hilarious? It was true. And you know, she's a pastor's wife now. Yeah, she was a baby mama and all that, but she enjoyed it for a while. 
But then she kind of got tired of it, you know, going to church every Sunday, talking to people all the time about maybe their problems and issues, telling her husband every week, oh, that was a great sermon, honey, <laughs> even though it went too long. All those things, the pressure of being in the spotlight, you know, people watch, you know, what you wear, what you don't wear, what you drive, what you don't drive, where you live, where you don't live, all this stuff. And Gomer's like, man, I've had enough. After a couple of years, she was like, I deserve to be happy. I miss the A-lister life. I miss the thrills and the chills. And I mean, I'm, I'm tired of this kind of boring life. So she sends Hosea a text. I'm out. And she left. It devastated Hosea. Hosea loved her to pieces. I mean, she was his girl, and now she's gone. His head was spinning. He comes back home. His kids are like, where's mom? Hosea was like, she's gone. He awkwardly tries to cook dinner to help them with their homework and puts them to bed, and then as he walks back into the master bedroom, he can still smell the scent of her perfume. He's devastated. Gomer, running from Hosea, running from God. I got a question for you. Have you ever gone Gomer? I think we've all run from God. The Bible says, in Hosea chapter two, verses six and seven, therefore I will block her path with thorn bushes. This is God talking about Gomer. I shall wall her in so that she can't find her way. She'll chase after her lovers, but not catch them. She'll look for them, but not be able to find them. So she's kinda going off the ranch, isn't she? She's kind of going down that proverbial rabbit hole. A couple of years ago, Lisa and I and our family were hiking. And sadly, as we walked through the woods down this trail, I was leading the way, which is not good because I'm directionally challenged. In fact, you've never met anyone who has as bad a sense of direction as I do. Just trust me, it's awful. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably some sort of a condition that I have, I don't know. <laughs> As I was walking, leading the family, Lisa was behind me, the kids were kind of like, you know, they were bored. It's so hot, you know, walking down this trail. And so I'm just walking and Lisa's behind me and boom! I hit some major thorn bushes. They were like disguised. Ripped my jeans. That's some blood, you know? Whoa. So I stopped. And Lisa goes, oh, I hit some too. And I look back and the kids are all like <laughs> entangled in these briars. EJ was so entangled. I said, EJ, just strip your shirt off, man. Cause you're not gonna be able to get out unless you strip. So we had to strip just to get out of this. And then he got his you know, shirt and everything, put it back on. Well, finally, as we discovered we were barricaded, we had to just back out, you know, and retrace our steps, and of course, we made it. Whenever we run from God, whenever we go Gomer, God always barricades us with briars. He makes it difficult for us to run. We feel that scratch of sin, you know, that, that, that puncture. We're all entangled. God, in his love, is going, don't keep going. Retrace your steps. Don't bolt through the briars. But you know how we are. We, we go Gomer, don't we? And Gomer, she was just like, yeah, I feel some briars, but I'm gonna 
bolt and tear right through those briars. And she was about to go over the edge. What does God do after that? Well, here's the principle. Sin rips and sin also strips. Wait a minute, at some of the time? No, eventually, all of the time. After God barricades us with briars, if we just, boom, bolt through the briars, he then removes those resources from our lives. He just removes them, methodically, strategically. And that's what happened to our girl, Gomer. She got some mileage on her. She had one too many cosmetic procedures. Guys wouldn't touch her anymore. I mean, she had to lower herself to go to that club or that bar to work that street corner. She was an A-lister, and now she's just like nothing. What we chase, what we think will give us freedom will end up enslaving us and ruining our lives. Now, now, now God doesn't want us to bolt through the briars. He doesn't want us to get to this stage where he ruthlessly removes those resources. He's doing it, he's allowing it, so we will turn to him. Yesterday, I performed and officiated a funeral for a man in our church who was definitely a foundation here, a fixture here at Fellowship Church. His name was John Mark Bonneau. He's Derek and Kevin's father. They're both pastors here at our church. In 1999, the Minos decided to attend church, to give church a shot, and their lives were never the same. I mean, I can see them right now, sitting right about there, always engaged, always you know, nodding, always smiling, and John Mark, Derek and Kevin's father, would always laugh at my humor, even though it wasn't funny. Amazing, amazing guy. He passed away, and I was honored to do the funeral. It was so interesting to see how he planted himself and his family here in this church. They were here almost every Sunday. And I think about the influence of their family, of Derek and Kevin. You could argue hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that they touch through their different ministries here at Fellowship Church. I think about their wives. I think about Penny, John Mark's wife, and the daughter-in-laws and grandchildren. Amazing! Now, I was thinking before I did this funeral, I was like, okay, okay, okay. Ed, the last funeral you did, when, when did you officiate a funeral? And so many things just kind of run together, you know, in my life, because I speak a lot, and I thought, I remember the last funeral I did before John Mark's funeral yesterday was the funeral of a multi-billionaire. This guy's private plane was a 737. Did deals all over the world. People were like, oh, he's wealthy, man. He's intelligent. That's all they said at the funeral. Oh, he recreated, procreated, he did some deals, and then he died. Rah, rah, rah. Oh, he was smart. Really? That's it? I ask you, who is wealthy? The multi-billionaire or John? Mark Bonneau, who was maybe, what, middle class, upper middle class? There's not even, you can't even make that comparison. The billionaire didn't even have a church where I could even do the funeral. 
If you had a problem, sleep with another girl. If you had a problem, do another deal. And you know, money is really good at numbing us. It's a God. It is. It's good. Money's good to numb things, but it's not God. It's not great. It's good. It's not great. But even when you follow money, after a while, you're like, that's it. This guy dies, and you know what happens when you die. Tax attorneys and attorneys and kids fight over everything if you have anything left. Really? So that's it? You made money. Wow. Good for you. The guy was destitute. John Marbino, transcendently wealthy. Hosea saw what Gomer was doing, and here's what God said. God said, you know, Hosea, just, just send her some money. So he Venmoed her some money, gave her some gold and silver. And the Bible says he stood at a distance, Hosea, and watched her. And Gomer thought that one of her past clients had been motor, and she thanked him <laughs> and didn't even realize the source of the blessing. How many times does that happen in our lives? We're running from God, we bolt through the briars, he removes the resources, and in the middle of that, God blesses, and we go, oh, it's just serendipitous. Oh, it just happened. And at this funeral, the people that spoke before me were going, oh, he was a self-made man. You've got to be smoking some serious dope. Self-made? He's a God-made man. God gave him the intelligence. God gave him the breaks. God gave him the background. God gave him the money. He didn't honor God with it, but he did. God did. He never, ever said, God, you are the source. That's why his life is a tragedy of what might have been. Don't let that be you. You want to chase after fame? Hey, students, you want more followers? You want to chase after fame, really? You'll be a slave to fame. You want to change popularity? Jump into bed with this guy, with that guy, if you're a girl or a guy, this girl, that girl. Oh, you'll be a slave to that desire. A slave. You can't get away from it. Don't go Gomer. Well, here's how much God loves you and me. When we do, bolt through the briars. When he does, ruthlessly remove the resources. We find ourselves like Gomer. Gomer had nothing left. I'm giving you the short story here, the Wikipedia. A guy wouldn't even touch her. It was so sad. She made herself available on the trading blocks, the slave auction. Just read about ancient slave auctions. They were absolutely brutal. Strip you naked, and there you are. And there she was. I'm sure all the guys were like, man, just hurling insults at her. I remember when you were this and that and whatever. So they start bidding for her. No one bidded very much for her. But God said, Hosea, I want you to buy her back. I want you to redeem her. So out of nowhere, Hosea raised his hand and he bid 15 pieces of silver. And the auctioneer said, sold to the man in the back. 
Can you imagine how he had to swallow his pride, his ego, his humiliation as he walked to the front, read the scripture, covered her in blankets, took her home and treated her like she had never sinned before. Sin rips, sin strips. God's grace grips. That's how much we matter to God. That's how much God loves you and loves me. Years ago, I spent the night doing the job of someone who was a SWAT officer. One of my close friends headed up a SWAT unit in a major city. He was kind enough to invite me to ride with him all night. We were involved in a major, major drug bust. I say we, he was. <laughs> and we were tracking down this guy named Rambo who worked for a gang and he was an assassin. He had killed 10 people with this special sawed off shotgun. We were chasing this guy. He was chasing this guy. I was riding with him. It was a true adrenaline rush. You couldn't do that now, but I did it then. Just aside, you know, when we, when we did this drug bust, it was a major dope house. I mean, there were people all in there and we thought Rambo was in there. So we all drive up, you know, the lights off to this house and everything. Bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come on you? Bad boy, anyway. And I was just kind of like going, wow, this is cool, until my friend Jim goes, okay, we're going in for the bust. He goes, uh, open the glove compartment. He goes, see that pistol there? Take it. I go, Jim, I'm not going in. He goes, no, 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 you're sitting in the car, but if someone comes up to the car, just shoot him in the head. <laughs> I thought he was joking. And man, they went in and did this drug bust trying to find Rambo. And then afterwards they like, okay, Ed, come on in. And it was, it was crazy. That was one episode. Then the other one was we were driving along, I don't know, 4 a.m. in the morning. And we passed this car and Jim said, something's not right about that car. And he runs the license plate. This guy was a really bad guy. So we start following him. Didn't have a light or anything. We just kind of started following this really bad guy. And he started going faster and faster. And Jim went faster and faster. And finally, I looked down as I was white knuckling the seat. We were going 120 miles an hour, power sliding on freeways, going after this guy. I mean, you're talking about high speed pursuit. We were on it. And finally, we kind of blocked him and moved him into an area where there was a train track and he just stopped and got out of the car. He was like, you know, I, I give up. Now that's a crass illustration, but our God is a God who is in high speed pursuit of you and me. We're criminals, we've broken the law, we're self-centered sinners. What are you gonna do as you respond to God's love. What are you gonna do with God's love note? Circle yes or no, do you love me? Yes or no, it's your choice. But going back to Gomer, we all are standing on that auction block, ripped and stripped of everything. And our culture is bidding for us. Materialism is bidding for us. Sensuality, fame, fortune. Suddenly though, a hand goes up in the back. It's a nail 
pierced hand. And a voice rings out, I bid my blood for that one. And Jesus Christ points to you and he points to me. He walks through the crowd. He robes us in righteousness. We're adopted into his family. And he shows us as we walk what grace is all about. Before the credits roll in your life, how will you respond to the grace of God? Let's bow. Father, thank you for your word that's so powerful and so poignant. I pray, God, if there's someone here and you've never, ever, ever given your life to Christ that you would just simply say, Jesus, I know you love me. I realize you've been pursuing me and I accept the ransom that you paid for my freedom, your death, burial, and resurrection. I receive that, Lord. I give you all that I am and all that I'll ever be. If you prayed that prayer, that's the greatest thing that you'll ever do. Others, you might be here and you're like, man, I, I didn't realize how much God loves me. I didn't realize the grip of grace. I didn't realize, no matter what I've done, that God is right there chasing me down, asking me to circle yes or no. I wanna walk in that love, Father. You indeed are the cornerstone of my life and the cornerstone of this church. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right, and if you wanna be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your life. 